ادعو الى سبيل ربك بالحكمه والموعظه الحسنه وجادلهم بالتي هي احسن ان ربك هو اعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو اعلم بالمهتدين بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع الهدى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters in Islam, welcome to another session on the topic of tafsir based on the order of revelation of the surahs in which we are calling this series Radiant Rays of Light from the Speech of the Lord of Mercy and Might. Today we're gathered under our third lecture. And before we embark upon the journey of trying to extract some of the meanings of the glorious Qur'an, We want to set the stage and we want everyone to understand the situation and the circumstances that were in Arabia prior to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam receiving the final revelation, the Noble Quran. In some of our previous discussions, we talked about the political conditions in Arabia before the revelation of the Quran. We talked about the economic condition in Arabia before the revelation of Quran. And today, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we're going to discuss briefly a little bit about the social conditions in Arabia before the revelation of Quran, as well as what was the religious condition in Arabia before the revelation of the Qur'an. So as many of you probably already know and understand, Arabia, during the time prior to the revelation of the Qur'an, Arabia was a male-dominated society. The men were head of the households, the men were in charge of the business, the men were the ones calling the shots, the the chiefs of the tribes were men. So women really had no status of any kind other than they were looked at as sex objects and those who could produce children, those who could serve the husband. And At that time, the number of women a man could marry was unlimited. Sometimes you would find the chiefs of tribes married to 10 women at one time, 15 women at one time, 7 women at one time. So it was unrestricted. It was unlimited. And when a man died, when a father died, his son inherited all his wives except the mother who gave birth to him. And one of the savage and barbaric customs of some of the Arabs prior to Islam was to bury their female infants alive. Even if some of the Arabs did not wish to bury their daughters alive, they still had to uphold this tradition, which was considered honorable, and they were unable to resist social pressures. And many of them did this. They buried their daughters alive out of fear of their daughters growing up in poverty or that their daughters may grow up to be prostitutes or sex slaves or captured by another tribe and they will turn her into a prostitute or becoming the wife of someone who didn't respect her. 
So the Arabs prior to Islam, prior to the sending of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, many of them had this practice, and they had this justification in their minds as to why they would bury their daughters alive. There are some historical narrations that would mention, and also in some some poetry, some old Arabic poetry, the 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 Ash'ar al-Jahiliya. Prior to Islam, you would find that. Some of them would talk about when the mother was going through her labor pains, that they would bring her out to the desert and dig a hole and be ready for the baby to come out. If it was a daughter, then it would just go from the womb of the mother straight into the hole and then be immediately covered with dirt. If it was a male child, then everyone in the tribe would be happy. They would be elated they would be blissful and they would welcome this new male child into the world. But as for the female children that were born, many of the Arab tribes, not all of the Arab tribes, but many of the Arab tribes would resort to burying their female infants alive out of fear that they may grow up being disrespected or resort to prostitution or selling themselves as sex slaves oh, that, as that was predominant in that, that time. Another social ill that was common amongst the pre-Islamic Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula was drunkenness. And drunkenness went hand in hand with their habit of gambling. So drunkenness and gambling was a common vice amongst the Arabs who were living in the time of Jahiliyyah prior to the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they were known to be compulsive drinkers and compulsive gamblers. And we know this when we look back to much of the Arabic poetry that was written prior to the sending of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where many of the poets would talk about drinking or becoming sakran, becoming drunk, or gambling, or taking over this tribe or taking the other tribes, women and children as their slaves and servants. So if they were known to be compulsive drinkers and gamblers, then you would also say, well, the relations between male and female were extremely loose. There wasn't any segregation or separation between male and female. And even at that time, we find that there were women who were known as that rayat, that rayat, or the ladies of the flags, the ladies of the flags, who were known as prostitutes. So they would hang flags from their houses, um, letting the public know, letting the people know that they are prostitutes and they are sex slaves and that men who were traveling on the road with their caravans or in the city could visit them and do whatever they liked with the women without any strings attached. Also, from what we can understand, some of the social ills in Arabia prior to Islam is the different types of marriages. There were different types of marriages that may be common today, but not as common as they were during the pre-Islamic times. And these were four types of marriages. One type of marriage was similar to the type of marriage that is today, where a man grants his guardianship or daughter's hand in marriage to another man, and the proposing man offers her a dowry, offers her a wedding uh, dowry, a gift of whatever she desires, and then he marries her. This is similar to the way the tradition of marriage is found in many of the societies throughout the world today. Another type of marriage was where a man would say to his wife, after she finished her menses, send this man and asked to have intercourse with him, asked to have sexual relations with him. Her husband then would avoid her and does not touch her until it is clear that she is pregnant from that other man, 
with whom she had intimate relations with. And then when it became clear that she was pregnant, her husband would have intimate relations with her if he wants. And he acts simply from the desire for a noble child. And this type of marriage was known as nikah al-istibda, the marriage of seeking intercourse. Another type of marriage was when a group of men Rahat, of less than 10 men would visit the same woman a group of less than 10 men would all visit the same woman and all of them have sexual relations with her if she keep if she became pregnant and bore a child when some nights had passed after the birth she sent for all of those men and then she would choose which one of them was the father and whoever she chose nobody could refuse even if it wasn't their biological child so when these men would gather together in her presence she would say to them you know the result of your bad deeds your acts what you did with me i have born a child and he is your child so and so and then she would name the individual who she wanted to take responsibility for fathering that child and the father had or the man who actually engaged in those sexual acts with her would not be able to refuse or not be able to deny the child so this was a type of marriage that was present in the time of jahiliya the fourth type of marriage that was present is when many men frequent one woman and she didn't keep herself away from anyone who came to her and as i mentioned these were the prostitutes so they would set up their flags on their door or the banners on their houses and whoever wanted to visit them would visit them. And if one of them conceived or bore a child, they gathered together to her and summoned those physiognomists. And then they attached her child to the man whom they thought the father was, and the child remained attached to him and was called his son. And no objection to this course was possible. But when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came preaching the truth, he destroyed and removed all of those types of marriage of jahiliya, of the pre-Islamic times, except the type of marriage which is still with us today which is the common marriage where a male goes and proposes to the father of a female and then the father the wali the guardian or her brother whoever her guardian is accepts or rejects and then the man in exchange gives the woman a dowry so there were other social ills in arabia as well as we mentioned there was and this is directly retied to some of the political affairs and economic affairs and situations that there was tribal fighting there was oppression of the orphans and the women women could not inherit if if a woman's father died the women would not inherit the men and the males of the family would inherit all of the things that were allotted and supposed to go to the women if somebody was made an orphan Okay, the orphans were oppressed, their wealth, their possessions that were left behind from their parents was taken. They were transgressed against. And there was a lot of oppression and dhulm and tyranny in the society prior to the sending of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was as if people were living in a jungle where... The laws in the jungle is the strong conquers the weak. The larger group takes advantage of the smaller group. So those were just some of the social, the political, the economical situations in Arabia prior to the revelation of the Quran. What was the religious situation in Arabia prior to the revelation of the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So this period in the Arabian history 
which preceded the rebirth of Islam is known as al jahiliya or the times of ignorance. And judging by the beliefs and the practices of many of the pagan Arabs who used to worship idols, it becomes apparent that many of them were misguided. Many of them went astray from the tradition and the religion of Ibrahim and Ismail who actually were in Mecca hundreds of years before the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they were the ones who built the Kaaba in Mecca but many of them went astray started worshipping idols worshipping numerous gods and majority of the Arabs who left the religion of Islam, of Ibrahim, that Ibrahim and Ismail brought, many of them were idolaters and polytheists. They worshipped numerous idols. And each tribe actually had its own idol or own practice or fetishes. And they had turned the Kaaba in Mecca, which had been built by the Prophet Ibrahim and his son Ismail, and it was dedicated by them to the service of one God alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Arabs went astray and eventually turned the Kaaba and Mecca into a pantheon housing over 360 idols made of stone, made of wood, sometimes made of dates. And the one to introduce these idols into the Kaaba was a man by the name of Amr ibn Luhay who was actually traveling in one of the caravans and he was returning back, some say from Jeddah, some of the narrations say from Syria, and he saw a large amount of idols washed up on the shore in Jeddah or he found them in Syria in the marketplace and brought them back with him on his caravan into Mecca and placed them in the vicinity of the Holy Kaaba in Mecca and then the people started to slowly, slowly move away from worshipping Allah alone as the remnants of the religion of Ibrahim and started worshipping these idols, sacrificing for these idols, believing that these idols have the power to benefit and the power to remove harm and the likes of these false types of worship which are dedicated to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second group that we find amongst the Arabs in the pre-Islamic times, in which unfortunately is increasing in many of the Arab lands today, are the atheists. The atheists were composed of a group of materialists and believed that the world was eternal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them and their statements in some verses in the Qur'an. And then you have the Zindiqs. The Zindiqs, they were influenced by the Persian doctrine of dualism in nature. They believed that there were two gods representing the twin forces of good and evil or light and darkness. And both were constantly locked up in an unending struggle for supremacy. That good and darkness are good and bad were constantly fighting light and darkness were constantly struggling against each other also another group that we find that were present amongst the Arabs and, and some of the religions that some of those Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula practiced were the Sabi'in and these people they worshipped the stars they had a deep knowledge of astronomy, astrology. They depended upon the stars and believed that the stars had different effects on the seasons, on the weather, would give them information whether to travel to this land or not to travel to that land. So they worshipped the stars, the constellations in the stars. And then we have the Jews. The Jews who were more prevalent in Medina. So when the Romans conquered Jerusalem 
in the year 70 common era and pushed the Jews out of the area of Palestine and Syria and Sham, many of them found new homes in Hejaz, in Arabia, and specifically in Yathrib, in Medina. And their strong centers were the towns of Yathrib, which is Al-Medina, Khaybar, which is a little bit uh, east of Medina, and Fadiq. So the Jews were also present, and as we talked about previously, they were known to be the industrialists, some of the businessmen, and some of them who were in Medina, and also in Khaybar were farmers who farmed different types of fruits and vegetables, but uh, more commonly known is that they were um, farmers who were farming and planting the date palm trees. Another religion that was found in Arabia were the Christians. The Christians were found in northern Arabia. So the Romans had, with the spread of their empire, they had converted the north Arabian tribe of Ghassan to Christianity. And eventually some tribes of Ghassan, some clans, had migrated to and settled in the Hejaz area. And in the south, there were many Christians as well. In Yemen, there were many Christians where the creed was originally brought by the Ethiopian conquerors and invaders of that land. And their strong center at that time was the town of Najran, Najran, which is in southern Saudi Arabia. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, there were monotheists. There were a small faction, there was a small group of monotheists present in Arabia on the eve of the rise and the rebirth of Islam. Its members, they didn't worship idols, they didn't worship Jesus, they still remained upon the religion of the Prophet Ibrahim and Ismail, which was Islam, submitting to Allah and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So the members of the families of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most members of their clan, Banu Hashim, and many of them belonged to this group, the descendants of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salatu wa atamu taslim. So now that we've discussed some of the political conditions, social conditions, religious conditions, let's talk a little bit about the education in Arabia before the revelation of the Qur'an. As we mentioned, many of the Arabs, they were blessed with very eloquent tongues. They were blessed with the ability to speak well, to memorize and recite poetry that they had written or they had memorized. or So there were some Arabs who were able to write and read, but they were very few, a very small percentage. But the majority didn't know how to read or write, and they were known as the Ummiyun, the illiterate nation. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions in the Quran that the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, he was sent to the Ummiyin. He was sent to those who were illiterate, those who in the majority of the cases didn't know how to read and didn't know how to write. Fil Ghalib. And even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself didn't know how to read and didn't know how to write. So the Arabs were known for their strong memories, their eloquence, and to pass down verbal traditions generation after generation. So there were very few individuals who could actually read and write. And most of them, they were not interested in learning how to read or write. They were busy with their business. They were busy with their sheep, their camels, or their goats. They were busy with their... Uh, caravans traveling back and forth. They were busy money lending as such. So some historians are of the opinion that the culture of that period prior to 
the sending of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, was almost all oral tradition. That even business transactions were oral by the handshake or contracts were written or contracts were accepted by oral acceptance by i want to marry your daughter and i will offer five thousand dinar as the dowry do you accept yes i accept okay i need a loan for one thousand dirham okay i'll remember i remember your face i know where you live i know your tribe i need that money back in a month if you don't i'm going to come to your house or i'm going to go after your tribe and get my money back so it was more known that the jews and the christians they were the at that time they were the custodians of knowledge they were the custodians of reading and writing in arabia at that time and the greatest intellectual accomplishment of the Arabs of that time was their poetry and po prose. And they claimed that Allah had bestowed the most remarkable qualities of the intellect upon the Greeks. As it was proven in their philosophies and in their science. And the greatest qualities of handwork and craftsmanship was with the Asians, with the far Asians, the Chinese. And of the tongue upon the Arabs. And the proof was their eloquence and their poetry. So the Arabs at that time, their greatest pride before and after Islam was their eloquence and was their poetry and it still remains today. So in nomad Arabia, the poets were part of the war equipment of the tribe they would defend their own tribe and damaged hostile tribes by the employment of a force which was supposed indeed to work mysteriously, but which in fact consisted in composing dexterous phases of a sort that would attract notice and would consequently be diffused and remembered widely. So many times when the Arab tribes would go to war they would have these poets and they would be reciting some of their poetry against the opposing tribe to try to mess with their head or mess with their brain and most of the information that we find about the economic conditions the social conditions the moral of the arabs in the fifth and sixth centuries common era comes from much of the ancient Arabic or pre-Islamic poetry, which is known for its photographic faithfulness to all phases of Arabian tribal life, its environment, the women, the drunkenness, the alcohol, the battles, the tribal warfare, the different years that of droughts, the different years of storms, the different years of conflict, what this tribe did to that tribe, what my grandfather did to his grandfather. So many of the specialists of history, when they look and they want to find historical narratives of Arabia, of the Arabs prior to Islam, they refer back to this old Arabic poetry. Okay, and they call it Sha'ar al-Jahili, okay, the, the poetry of the Jahili times. And many specialists, they accept this poetry as the most important and authoritative source for describing the Arabs and their customs during that period. So Arabic poetry, which was a part of education, was rich in eloquence and balagha. And it was nevertheless a faithful mirror of life in ancient Arabia. And also in cultivating poetry that the, the Arab poets they were unconsciously developing one of the greatest artifacts of mankind the Arabic language and the greatest compositions of the Arabs prior to Islam were called the golden odes or the seven poems okay mu'allaqat the sab'a okay and they supposedly surpassed excellence 
in the power of the language, the eloquence of the Arabic language. And many of them were actually hung on the Kaaba. They were actually hung. Many of the poems of the pre-Islamic Arabs were hung on the Kaaba as a challenge for anyone to try to match them or outdo them in their eloquence or to challenge any aspiring genius to excel what is written in those poems. And this is how their poems became famous. Because when the people would travel to Mecca, remember, people would still travel to Mecca. They would circumambulate and make tawaf around the Kaaba. Some of them naked. Some of them, if they had enough money, they would buy the clothes from Quraysh, which they would raise the prices exceedingly so that only the rich would be able to go around the Kaaba with proper clothing. But of course, they weren't, many of them were not doing tawaf around the Kaaba, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were paying tribute to these different idols. So these idols that were in the vicinity of the Kaaba, they would go and slaughter a sheep for their idol or go and bring gold or silver for this idol. Or they would go and bring fruits or perfumes or spices to these different idols. So anytime somebody would come to Mecca and see the Kaaba, they would find these poems attached to the Kaaba. And when they were going around the Kaaba, many times they would look at it every time they passed the certain side of the Kaaba and then they would memorize it. And they, when they would go back home, they would narrate it to their kinsfolk, to their tribesmen. And this is how much of the Arabic poetry spread throughout the Arab lands. So Arabia, before the revelation of the Quran, as we mentioned, was without social amenity or historical depth. And many of the Arabs lived in moral bankruptcy and spiritual servitude. Life for them... It was devoid of meaning, of purpose, and direction. Many of them didn't know why they were created. Many of them didn't know how to worship the Creator, similar to many of those living in the West today. The soul of many of them, and the majority of them, was in chains and was awaiting as it was a signal to make a titanic struggle to break loose and become free. And the impetus for that change, for that break in the chains, was ignited in the year 610 Common Era by Allah, the Lord of creation. When he looked at all of the hearts upon all of the human beings on the face of the earth and found that the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most purest of hearts. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the son of Abdullah, living in the city of Mecca. Allah chose him to receive his first part of revelation and to start his mission of prophethood and revive the teachings of Ibrahim which was Islamic monotheism. So the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, who embodied the teachings of Islam, the instruction book for mankind, the Quran and its teacher, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, was and is and will remain the greatest blessing for all of mankind until eternity. It set men and women free through freeing them and liberating them from being obedient and subservient to the creatures in the creation and letting them only be obedient to the Creator. It set men and women free from slavery in all of its manifestations. Slavery in creed, slavery in belief, physical slavery to other human beings, mental slavery to other ideas or ideologies. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah, he was the supreme emancipator of mankind. He extracted men and women 
from the pits of life and save them from their destination in the hellfire. Another factor that is very important when embarking on this journey to extract the benefits and the guidance from the Quran is looking at where the Arabian Peninsula is located geographically. It's geographically peripheral and politically terra incognito until the early 7th century common era. It was then that Allah, through the Quran and through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu put Arabia on the political map of the world by making it the theater of momentous events of history. Before Islam, the Arabs had played only a marginal role in the history of the Middle East, and most likely they would have remained forever a nation of shepherds and merchants if Allah did not send the Quran and its teacher, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, to give them the focus and the stimulus that welded their scattered nomadic tribes into a purposeful driving force. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the Quran, with the Quran, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and its teacher, its final teacher, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, molded a nation an empire out of a rough mass without any type of structure. He invested the Arabs with a new dynamism, a new idealism, and explosive creativity, and they changed the course of history for all of mankind. He created an entirely new mental and psychological ecology, and his work placed an emphatic period in world history and it was the end of one era and the beginning of a new era so brothers and sisters in islam after discussing some of the political social what was the educational situation the religious situation in arabia hopefully we gain an understanding and we can set the stage of what was taking place and what were the conditions at the time that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu received his first revelation from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that will bring us to our next topic which we will cover bi'idhnillah in our next lesson, our next meeting. We will go over what is revelation, what is wahi. What does it mean? Where does it come from? Who is responsible for conveying it? What were the different methods of revelation? Is there direct revelation from Allah to the prophets? Or is there an intermediary, one who brings it from Allah to the prophets and messengers? What are the different effects of the different types of revelation? So in our next lecture, next discussion, we're going to talk about revelation in detail with proofs and evidences so that we can get an understanding of what revelation is before we embark upon the journey of studying the greatest book of revelation, which is the book of Allah, the Noble Quran. So stay tuned. Until next time, follow up, inshallah, with our lectures. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.